It's 2023, and if you haven't been abducted by aliens yet, you're clearly not trying hard enough. You know, every day that goes by the movie Mars Attack starts seeming more and more like a damn documentary. Joining me today are the authors of the book, Who They Are and What They're Up To. They are both UFO witnesses, and one of them, one of the two, has been directly contacted with aliens. Please welcome Leslie and Stephen Shaw. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Sure. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into it, right? So I'd imagine that you two met aboard the alien aircraft. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Enterprise, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, dear. Uh, nice. well, so I want yeah. to... Um, I don't even know where to start, really, because it's such an interesting story. So is there a, a direct place that you guys find it uh, most simplistic to start, or how should we do this? Yeah, we, sure. we begin usually with our uh, joint UFO experience. Uh, my It's my first and Stephen's mm-hmm. fourth Fifth. Uh, UFO. Fifth. And uh, before that, no, that was the fourth. Yeah. So that the before that, I believed him. 95% I believed him that this happened to him and he saw these things. But then there was that day I saw mine and uh, then I was a hundred percent believer because you can't unsee it once you see it, you know. Um, it was a, a, a white light up in the sky. We saw it when we were driving. It was in, in, in front of us and uh, it seemed to be just be hovering and it grew larger as we approached it. And then it shot away and was gone over the northern horizon in less than a quarter of a second. It was just, it had to have been going 20,000 miles an hour. And and instantly at speed, too. It didn't, like, ramp up its speed and get there. It just suddenly was going at 20,000 miles an hour. Was there a noise that you heard with it as well? Silent. Silence. They are silent, usually. And where exactly was this? Where were you located? Uh, it was in Joshua Tree, California. 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 Uh, we were, yeah, we're heading uh, west on a about highway. a half an hour, about a half an hour from Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. We thought it. Yeah, we thought. Uh, in fact, I thought it was a first. I thought it was a plane, maybe coming into Palm Springs Airport, but uh, then it didn't have those running lights, nothing blinking, and it was silent. And then it did the crazy twenty thousand mile an hour thing. A white light in the sky could be a, any number of things, but nothing mm-hmm. moves like that. This nothing. was roughly about yeah. two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Mm-hmm. Two thousand five. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so, then um, so after that, I mean, Stephen had been his family has had the abduction experience, um, and he's also a UFO witness. But uh, that was sort of the beginning of our research when we began really researching the book together and to working. Now, Leslie. It. Were you a skeptic before you witnessed your first craft? No, I tried ha- really hard, like I say, to believe uh, without being a witness, just because you know my husband had uh, has has been very much a witness, and uh, I tr- I tried to believe, and I was watching the all the alien programs on television and reading a lot of books about it. And, yeah, and, honestly, <laughs> honestly, in the beginning, she would say, "Oh, sure." You know? <laughs> A lot of, you know, a lot of times Sometimes. she would just like, yeah, this like, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a natural instinct to, to have that reaction. Right. Because mm-hmm. there's, there's so many, I wanted to ask you guys right away. Like, how do you weed out the, the true stories from the fake stories? You well, know, is there um, a way to even do that? A good point. In fact, um, one of the, uh, the ways to do that is uh, report on mass sightings instead. Uh, you're mm. right. A single person could be. It could be a lie. It could be. They could sure. be insane and seeing something that isn't there. And uh, or, but if if 300 people call the police to report a UFO yeah. in their backyard, <laughs> yeah, or like yeah. like Fatima around the uh, World War One, yeah. that was also a, a very very the well whole town, yeah, whole so, town. Right. yeah. Yeah. So that kind of situation is that. So in our book, the first, uh, you know, we had to assume that. Uh, people would might pick up the book who knew nothing about the UFO phenomenon, or very little, or very least. little, right? So we had to write the first two chapters are essentially a, like a crash course in the UFO phenomenon uh, happening in the U.S. We 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 kept it just to the U.S. so that it would only be two chapters, and uh, then in chapter three we're able to start getting once we've educated them to the beginning ufology level, we can begin discussing our theories at that point. Wow. Okay. So 
another question that comes along with this when people are, are starting to see ufos i gotta ask and this doesn't automatically like eliminate you you know and that's not the point of this podcast it's like trying to see what's real and what's fake i want to you know understand your story but sure do you guys do drugs nope, nope. i do drugs i do lsd and <laughs> and mushrooms so <laughs> you know that's, and that's, that's where fine. that's where the um where my alien story comes into existence and it's interesting because when you take a, a mind altering drug like that, you put yourself on a different frequency, it feels like. So it's like changing the radio knob, you know? Yes. So I'm wondering, do you think people are born on a different frequency and that's what makes it more people more susceptible to alien abductions? I, I'd like to answer this because I absolutely know this and believe this. Uh, for, for, for instance, my family came from wartime England. My parents grew up during World War II as children in Manchester and Oldham, which were being bombed almost as heavily as London. And my, my mom was uh, very uh, proficient at automatic writing, as was her mother, who was my grandmother, of course, and her sister. They're a very psychic and bunch, including Stephen. As, as, as an example, when I was nine years old, my, my mother picked me up from, from elementary school and she was crying her eyes out. I said, Mom, what's wrong? And she said, my mom just died in England. And I said, well, well, how do you know? And I said, well, I, I automatic wrote. I went into automatic writing and I was, I was contacted. And this happened when her father died, when their mother died, when Uncle Clifford died. She knew before anybody else she was contacted. So I grew up in a family that was odd, to say the least. We had this family spirit guy called Old Glegley that would visit people from time to time. And we think that he is actually a gray alien. Yeah, so, as an example, uh, that's why we I, talk about the family spirit guide. It's really this, this when the abduction I, phenomenon. You know, when I was 18, I was, I was not doing, I wasn't even drinking. <laughs> I was not doing any illicit drugs or anything. It doesn't matter, but I was I was very, very clean, and I was doing Tai Chi and things like that. And I had gone to sleep that evening. Uh, it was uh, 1979 in January. It was dark, and I woke up about 5, 5.30, and I was awake. I looked at my piano because I'm a pianist and an accordionist and a musician. Um, and I thought, well, what am I going to play today? And I thought about getting up. But, you know, it's, it's too early to start playing. And my, my dad and my sister were living with us. So and then I, I listened to the fountain in the other room. And from behind me, about from 30 feet behind me, uh, which was the front door, this blue-white entity, about six to seven feet tall, kind of skinny, approached me from behind at about with within about uh one and a half to two seconds and it was like floating walking and it stopped by my right side and it bent down to me and it froze the right side of my body the whole right side of my nervous system just went i couldn't move and it said hi steve <laughs> in my ear and i couldn't it was like it was not neither feminine nor masculine and i would thought oh great i'm going to see the family spirit guide old glegly but at the same time, my, my, my logical mind was saying, you know, buddy, you can't move. So I was both half fearful and half excited. And to this day, I can't remember whether it lasted five seconds or 15 seconds, but it lasted a fairly short period of time. And then it left. And I can't remember what, if I went to go and tell my dad. What I mean, I there's a lot of these weird missing time what, yeah, things missing right time. after these, these what, encounters. What I do remember is six hours later. I reached into my right-hand side pocket of the clothes I had been wearing when I went to sleep, and I pulled out the coins that were in my pocket to go get some lunch, and all the coins were magnetized, or they were sticking to each other. They were I could pick up the coins with the coins, and my dad and I looked at each other. We were both cabinet makers at the time. My, you know, my dad was trained in England. doesn't matter that part, but it was like, we know that's not possible. And I've still been looking for a reason for that how that could happen but that was yeah, the a coins physical, are, physical manifestation they're, was, they're designed to not to ever be magnetic right that's how they so they can be used in coke machines and sure. cigarette right. machines and whatever right yeah so and I, I was not the only uh, member of the family that's been a preached uh been approached by this uh this being uh, oglegly so this yeah. has been at least three generations that i know of in, but but then um 
see, they tamper with memory after they take people. They, they tamper with their memories. And Stephen's memory block is very hard. We haven't been able to break through it with hypnosis. But at one time, his brother Philip saw the gray aliens in his room. And so that's how we knew what the phenomenon was, what was sure. happening. And he also, uh, he, he, would, he saw a gray alien in his room one time and then blacked out immediately and had this big chunk of missing time. And then another time he, he was laying in bed and he heard it scrab, something scrabbling on the floor and he reached down to pet it and a hand grabbed his arm. And he again blacked out and had this big chunk of missing time. And, and another time he saw two very bright white lights outside of his window. This is in a totally different house up in Sonora, California that my dad and I built um, with our, you know, because we're cabinet makers and, you know, a uh, the carpenters at the time so you know the, the the first events happening to me were happening in fallbrook uh fallbrook house in woodland hills california and this this phenomena has followed me around personally to at least six different houses right and it's, it's not like a haunting that's right. like uh it's followed the, uh, the shah the roe family from england through california to you know to all the different places so it's it's not a haunting there's and you know we you know, we at this point, you know, we, we were, we're now believing or at least seeing that it's the reality is that we're actually being tracked for some genetic reason, most likely. Right. Our research um, with the abduction phenomenon, it, early on, we noticed that uh, UFO fact and UFO theories were not lining up. And this is another this one good example of it was. The UFO theory about the abduction phenomenon is just that they are scientifically interested in us. They just want a few human samples. No big deal. They just take them, take their samples and put you back. No problem. But that isn't what's happening. What we discovered was that the abduction phenomenon is almost entirely a Caucasian uh, uh, phenomenon. About 9 in 10. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, one study I, I looked at was 94.6% of seems a little abduction racist. victims are Caucasian. <laughs> and it seems like they're after a certain strain of DNA because what they do is they'll take a person again and again and again and again all through their lives. Uh, and then they'll start taking their children and their grandchildren. Once they find, like I say, a DNA strand that they're that, that meets their criteria, whatever it is, uh, then they, they tend to prey on that family for m multiple generations, like we think happened with Stephen's yes. family. Yes. Does this only occur at night? Um, you know, no. it's, it's kind of funny as far as that goes. Um, yeah, I've heard a few incidents, uh, but mostly at night. Yeah, for me, mostly at night. I, I had this ability when I was in my early 20s. I was practicing meditation techniques and I would uh, take like an afternoon, like a short afternoon nap between working as a cabinet maker. And I would just lay down the bed and I would uh, I would be completely in my room. And I was totally aware where I was and I would literally start picking up on radio stations, which is a weird thing to think about. Mm -hmm. But I would be listening to these different radio stations or people talking and I got up a few times. I thought, well, maybe maybe my neighbor's got the uh, got you know got his stereo playing too loud, or there's like something going on in the house. But I used to have that that ability where I would literally be picking up on different frequencies. In fact, what you said earlier about yeah. different tuning and being yep. maybe having the ability to listen to different frequencies, mm -hmm. and uh, you know maybe using uh, you know different substances to to enhance that i do believe i've it's my personal experience that for instance myself i have had and i still do to this day have the ability to i can like instead of listening to like 97.1 i can listen to 97.3 and 97.5 that kind of thing so um <laughs> go ahead so um, I, I was just i was gonna say um it, it seems like most of these times would you say that you're you're close to a dream state like you were you were tired a little bit yes i would say that's going into either the hypnagogic or the hypnopompic yeah. state where you're basically you're slowing down your brain waves which yeah. is getting into more of a rem cycle but it's a conscious rem cycle where your brain is going at about 11 to 14 cycles per second instead of in a beta where it's about 35 to 45 so yes it's um it's it's definitely it's, it is definitely p 
part of that, the receptive, the receptivity. Um, and, yeah. yeah, we have a chapter on uh, this in our book where we, Stephen and I both did some med- meditation and uh, chanting type work with uh, Buddhist teachers, uh, the kind it, that's designed to open your chakras and raise your kundalini energy. And uh, that's the slow way of opening and, your chakras. The fast way is drugs. And it, yeah, it's almost way. like it just tears them open and they're, they're I, yeah, wide I was, open after I was, that. I, I started yeah. studying Tai Chi when I was 17. I uh, Luckily, I had a very, very good teacher. And I, uh, I I taught it actually for 23 years and studied with different masters. And I took it very, very seriously. And I also studied the, the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. And I was very chaste as a young man. And so we, I think that has a lot to do with it, too. Yeah, I think we've learned that there's definitely a psychic component. Um, for one thing, they, the aliens, when they do abduct people, they communicate via, via telepathy. And we started noticing with all the kundalini re- uh, work that we were doing that we were becoming more telepathic. Yes. So we believe this may actually be like a human birthright that is just kind of atrophied in us, but has not atrophied in them. It's Can you give some examples of the telepathy? Yes. Uh, many, many times uh, abduction victims... They're spoken to by the aliens, but the aliens are not moving their mouths. They're they're using telepathy to communicate. In fact, it's almost it's almost always. Are you, are you talking about like our personal experiences? I want to know about like um, you said you guys almost became more telepathic. Yes. Yes. Right? We began. Yeah. To and so, each which senses all the time? And well, uh, one thing happened about a week ago, which is a <laughs> word that doesn't even exist. I know he does this I, all the time. He pulls I, stuff out of my head. I saw constantly. this as a, I saw this as a as a picture. She was having she was having trouble getting up, and she. I have arthritis. I, I was very I stiff. This, I saw um, I saw this word in my mind, uh, detorpify. And it was I was thinking in my head at that moment. I said, "Is detorpify a word even?" And then he pulled it really it out loud, yes. right there, just a and week it, ago. And and mm-hmm. you know, other th- times, sometimes it might be a com- you know a coincidence. We live together, we think the same way a lot, but it's not like that. It's like he's literally pulling uh, words um, out of my brain. And about about ten days ago, I I went to bed into the bedroom before Leslie, and Leslie was staying up because of uh, different reasons. I was watching TV, TV yeah. <laughs> and I I felt as if somebody got into the bed right next to me, and I thought to myself, "Okay, what do you want?" Because it's happened you knew to it me wasn't me. So many so many times. <laughs> Kind of, I kind of ignored it. So I was laying on my my left side, and I went to sleep. And then I woke up, laying face up, and I was going to get up, but I was, you know, still, you know, still a little bit sleepy. And I was going to get up, and then some entity or somebody in a slightly Chinese type voice said, "Husband," in my right ear. It wasn't in my head. It was right in my right ear. And my my wife Leslie has never called me husband. You know. Not just, different yeah. names, Stephen or whatever it may <laughs> or be. Or darling or but, honey. <laughs> right. It's like these these things, these manifestations I've had throughout my life too, getting in more to the hypno hypnagogic state, just starting to drift off where I'll get a distinct knocking three times right behind my head on the wall, or like a door slamming or glass breaking, or sometimes a, a flute being played. Um these things have literally, in a, in a sense, that's why the paranormal and the haunting kind of crosses over with, you know, with the with the uh, the alien type stuff. It's it's very strange, but this has been going on for me at least since the age of three um, that I can recall, and it's you know it's caused me a lot of sleepless nights to to say the least. So, do you try to look at these things objectively when they happen? Yes, we try. at first. At sci- we try and approach it on a scientific and logical uh, way. I mean, first, we, everyone that we can talk to about it, we have to presume that we're talking to somebody who at least believes that it's possible. Because the, the absolute non-believer will just, you know, think we're crazy. They're and call and, them demons or something like that. I've had <laughs> yeah. that. Sure, of that. course, yeah. But actually, I we grew- think the demon phenomenon and the v- vampire phenomena and the succubus and incubus phenomenons are actually 
thread out of the uh, alien abduction phenomenon. When you think about it, they come at night. They're very powerful. They, uh, they, they hypnotize, they hypnotize you, you, paralyze or, or you, or paralyze you, and they take your blood. They remove DNA from you some way, like blood, sucking blood. It's or very, very similar, which is kind of interesting. But like say, I grew up in a very no-nonsense family. And, and then the succubus phenomenon, right? That's that's right. also mm-hmm. the uh, that's that's like where they're their breeding program mm-hmm. do you, you know about the alien breeding program i can't it's say that bizarre. i do i know <laughs> it's just so strange <laughs> but uh I, I know we couldn't sound crazier if we were trying to make it up in a book or something but um our source for this was uh professor david m jacobs he's a uh, he was he did ten thousand uh, hypnotic regressions on uh abductees and he found that 1,100 of those 10,000 were women that had been abducted and impregnated. And then four months later, they take them again and remove the fetus. And then years later, they're taken again and introduced to their hybrid alien offspring that they understand telepathy-wise is their their own child. Yes. And so it's it like they, actual stories of this documented? Uh, yes. 1,100 are. documented uh, and the, by Jacobs. And the interesting thing is that the the uh, obstetricians that that have uh, followed these women that were the doctors, you know, did the ultrasound, said, yes, you're pregnant, and then... All of a sudden, they're not pregnant. The fetus is gone, and it looks like they were never a- actually ever pregnant. Right. It doesn't it's, look like a miscarriage It's not like a miscarriage where there's still tissue frequently up in the womb. Yes, this it is looks, documented. They described it as the womb is like vacuumed out. But so let me get this in- straight. Okay, so the woman gets abducted and then is placed back, and at this point, she's pregnant. Right. And then gets abducted again, and then and they gone. take it, And then they take the fetus, about four months. It seems to be that's that's the uh, the point as far as the uh, as far as what is needed for a, a human uh, host to be able to mature a fetus to a certain point. We think they grow them in vats in the well, they Dulce finish off. Air Force they finish Base. Off. They finish they finish growing them off in a growing them up in a certain way. Like you know, you've vat. heard things like such as star children being born, you know, human beings with enhanced, uh, you know, uh, mental and psychic abilities that are being born to this day. I just saw a, I just saw a, a YouTube video, which blew my mind because I'm a, I'm a semi-professional musician that play in orchestras and do performances. And so I, I saw this, this, this one and a half year old boy that was playing a modified version of Claire de Lune by the blue by Debussy on the piano. Okay without any music okay he's you know you know kids are just being born they call them star children and they literally have enhanced abilities and it you see it in every generation our shot our data shows that the the human genome has has uh, changed by seven percent in the past hundred years it only just about the past hundred years you know it's real strange enormous change for such a short period of time that is we enormous think, we think they are influencing our um our development What's real strange is a lot of these musicians that are, are like legendary, like Jimi Hendrix, you know, yes. they, all, they all die at the age of 27. There's a weird correlation between being great and dying at 27. Dying Jim Morrison's another one. And then, um, <laughs> you know, there, there's there's countless who just die at 27. And every time like a, an artist dies, I always go to look at the age. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Here we yeah, go again. Old, remember here, like the old saying, the flame that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. You know? Right. <laughs> right. I actually have a theory on that. <laughs> Let's hear yeah, it. I have a lot of theories. Yeah. I think that when people achieve success, sometimes they think, what? well, I've tried, I've stri- I've striven so hard for success my whole life, beating my head against this door of success. And then they get there and then they find out, oh, I'm not happy yet that wasn't the source of happiness, you know, and they kind of expected it. That's interesting. And yeah, a lot of them die just like by a heart attack. Maybe it's like a broken heart. I think they, they start abusing themselves and looking for happiness in, you know, various other sources like drinking. Jim Morrison was, you know, uh, I believe it was, uh, he drank so much that was what finally killed yeah, him. Yeah, he's doing a lot of drugs. Uh, Brian drugs Jones, too, yeah. Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Kurt Amy Cobain, Winehouse. Yeah. I just yeah. pulled it up. You know, it's just like that's that's nuts. And really, happiness comes from within, and family, and love, and and connection, and warmth. It's not necessarily success. It's not. You don't think any supernatural 
shenanigans was going on? I don't well, think so with no, those I, famous I, people. I, I, I would yeah. think myself that as you start opening those doors, as we've been talking about, that when you open a door, you should also know how to shut the door, too. And sometimes people will open the door and they just aren't they don't have a mentor around that tells them, OK, like in, uh, you know, the Carlos Castaneda's books, you know, with Don. Don Juan and that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, well, you can open the door. That's great, but you better know how to shut it too because <laughs> you can have some pretty, you know, right. you, you can be like tortured for the rest of your life. If you're True, not. yeah. But that's what makes them great sometimes is they just have that one mode. Just go forward and do it 110%, no looking back. Yeah, Mo Mozart, yep. he died very early too from uh, consumption. I believe it was like at 32 or 33. And the Jeez. amount of stuff that he was able to produce in that short period of time. And he wrote everything down. He wrote everything down first time. He didn't have to, he didn't have to like, you know, erase and you know, redo stuff. He just, he was so gifted in that way as far as, as far as musically. It was, uh, he, he was a genius at, in, in music. That is for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Literally when, uh, I want to take it back real quick to uh, when when you we were talking about when you were coming in contact with these aliens, kind of in like a uh, almost like a dream state. You know, like my thoughts is you're you're entering like you're more susceptible and you're entering another dimension. You know, like I, yes. I don't think time and space are just like this linear thing. Like we're we're mm -hmm. we're taught. I think there are multiple things going on simultaneously, but uh, we can right. only interact with things that we have the tools for, you know, like we have eyes, ears, nose, et cetera, et cetera. And so I to move in the astral plane. Once we learn yeah. how it is possible to do astral projection and, and travel. It's, and it's real. And, and it we, does exist. Yeah. We, we actually achieved it ourselves. And but what we found, and this is very strange. I, when I went astral, I enjoyed the heck out of it. I went scuba diving without drowning and uh, no sharks could keep, kill me. I was, well, I was a disembodied voice. Yeah. I, I went to the Egyptian pyramids in my astral body, but whenever Stephen would uh, get into the astral realm, he would be harassed by these bizarre entities. It's almost like they're just on the other side of the psychic veil waiting for him to cross over so that they can uh, they can bother him some more. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, free, free yeah. The astral, like these astral... filters going on. Uh, pardon? You have like a filter, like a filter mechanism in your brain, like you said, like a mm -hmm. veil and... Yes, if you can just is. remove that, you can probably see what's on the other side like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I had this uh, one particular uh, weird thing happen with my ex-wife. I was 31 and I was awakened. Again, this is in uh, January, about like five or six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was awakened by the sound of very, very, uh, it was definitely a Harley Davidson being revved up. You can't Wait a bit, me. I got a Harley Davidson. Yeah, you know what the, what it sounds like, obviously. And this was in the courtyard. <laughs> I was in the second story of a condominium. This is in the courtyard. I heard this Harley Davidson. I thought, who that f is? You know, um, is revving up a Harley Davidson at five thirty in the morning? You know, and I got up and there was nothing there. So I went back to bed and it happened again. And I thought this is ridiculous. And then I tried to go to sleep. And then all of a sudden, all these entities came into my room my my wife at the time was getting ready to go to work and she was in the in the kitchen whatever and i had all these weird like demonic and weird creatures that were like trying to beckon me to come with them and like you know pressing on me and i i literally thought for a second there that i was losing my mind i was a i was a doctor of chinese medicine at the time and i i kind of justified it like the uh the veil between my subconscious and my conscious mind kind of got torn for a short period of time, I kind of was seeing what was going on in my in a different realm or my subconscious mind. And I actually sought some consultation about that. I thought this is very, very strange. And it was just as if they were in the room and I and I could not move. And it was um, it wasn't, you know, a, you know, sleep paralysis or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I know the difference between that. And he's yeah. standing. He was, you know, he'd gotten up uh, to see. Yeah, us. it was, it was, it was not sleep paralysis. And it was we, very it, odd. One of his other experiences he related to me, he's like nine years old and he heard a strange sound in the living room and he started walking down the hallway. I got it, out of the bunk bed. Yeah, you go ahead and tell it. Yeah, I got out of the bunk bed and I, I could hear something. It wasn't the dog. It was not human. It just sounded very, very odd. And I decided I was going to investigate. Of course, it's in the middle of the night again and I, 
Uh, my heart was pounding and I felt my blood pressure up and I was actually scared. I was actually kind of terrified. So I was definitely in my physical body and I was about to turn the corner and then everything just goes blank. And the next thing I remember about two or three hours later, I wake up back in my bunk bed as if nothing had happened. Uh, also, my brother, who was six years younger than me, he got so scared of the quote unquote little men that would visit him that he literally slept in our closet yeah, for about closet. two or three years. Whoa, as, really? You know, he, he slept in the closet. Oh my God. He, was, he, was, he was afraid. He was afraid. And, yeah. and unfortunately, yes. he, when he turned on his 51st birthday, he, you know, he, he, he taught calculus for fun and he was an engineer and he was a very bright individual and he just, we was, you know, my father had just died of lung cancer just in, in August of 2017. And he was taking care of my mother because he was living at the house and he decided that he couldn't take it anymore because my mother was very ill and uh, he killed both his cats first. And then he took a shotgun and blew her head off. Then he blew his head off on his 51st birthday. And so I lost almost my whole family. We bring this up because, you know, we believe that it was part of the whole phenomenon that he was, he, he grew up a kind of a hermit and a miser and kind of not quite, socially normal and we think it was due to this this phenomenon possibly it's it, it's very very disturbing for people have you it, seen the uh, uh, the movie the amityville horror mm-hmm. yes that's kind of what it reminds me of like there was like a possession going on there it seems like actually we think in this case that he just snapped um yeah from the pressure of the loss of his father and and but you know he was never what you'd call a, a stable individual and i we blame this this phenomenon for it in his youth he i mean if you're frightened for two years of your youth you're not going to be a a completely normal person yeah he, yeah i've had a bunch of uh therapists on and that's it's that's such an important time period god that i'm sorry that's awful yeah, it was quite tragic a, a lot a lot of his strange stuff happened when he was you know like around three and four and five years old and mm-hmm. then when he was with the getting taken and such that he was relaying that happened when he was 16 and and he um, built a house out in the woods in sonora and he just started getting all kinds of visitation and the orbs, orbs following him yeah. and uh one time uh, we were visiting at the time up in the area and uh the, na- the next morning he said there was an orb on my patio last night my deck i went out to to look at it and it rushed him it it zoomed at him and rushed him and and penetrated his chest and came out his back he said and I looked at his back and there was a bruise. There was a big greenish, brownish bruise right where he said the thing had exited him. And so I, I thought that was pretty odd too. What do you make of all of these new whistleblowers and the alien sightings nowadays? Because there's there's like a whole rollout, it seems like, is, oh, is yes. happening right now. We listen to every word, I assure you. Yeah, we, 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 po- we followed the disclosure yeah. over the summer quite quite closely. Quite you know, close, with, so yes. with Graves and Fravor and... Um, yeah. You know, the the really, it started in 2017. The, the uh, government stonewalled us for 80 years. Just this phenomenon is not happening. It's just yeah. mass hysteria. It's uh, swamp Whatever gas. Whatever excuse it's, you want to use. It's just lie, lie, lie for 80 straight years. And then uh, in 2017, Luis Elizondo, the head of ATIP, which is the UFO uh, investigation government department at the time, he released three videos to the New York Times with a story. and. Um, much to our shock, the uh, the DOD, the Department of Defense, immediately released a, a statement saying, these videos are real, they're a real phenomenon, and we just don't know what it is, but it's an unknown, a real unknown phenomenon. And our collective ufology jaws dropped that they were willing to admit this finally after 80 years of lying and stonewalling. Of course, they're still lying because we think they have they actually have uh, alien craft in their possession and alien bodies and possibly some live aliens. So well, that's we, what they said. They said they, know, they have them. They, they just don't want to release it. it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what worries me is like, what's up with the, the slow drip? You know, it, it's, it's 2024. Or we're about to be in 2024. I'm sorry. It's an election year. And I mean, if there was ever a time for real life news covering 
like this scenario to happen, I'd say it's going to happen in 2024 because this slow leak of information and whistleblowing about alien contact may be preparing us for some kind of rollout. Have you heard of uh, was it Project Bluebeam? Well, just just uh, I, I I agree with you there as far as this slow drip. There is a, a famous experiment when you're when you're going through medical school that you hear about the. Uh, the frog in the warm water experiment right, right. where yep. they, yeah, you know, where they slowly turn it up and, and they gets acclimatized and, and literally gets just numb to the fact that it's, it's going to die. And I think they're doing a similar thing like that. You know, even, even with movies and such, we're getting, you know, we're, we're not freaked out by seeing aliens that look kind of, you know, human like, but are blue and green and, and whatnot and seeing star Wars and star Trek and they're, 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 they're acclimating us they're slow, acc- slowly. Yeah. Slowly being, being believed. If, if, whichever way you look at it, we are slowly being acclimated. And I think part I think of that so, because so people don't panic, right? Yeah, you because know? back in '38, uh, uh, Orson, Orson Orson Welles, Welles you know, them. rolled out, of course, the War of the Worlds, and he even announced ahead of time that this was a dramatic uh, interpretation. It was it was not real, right? But some people turned in a little bit too late, and and people they actually thought it was committed, real committed and they freaked suicide out. Yeah. And they freaked out. So you know, uh, human beings were we're very xenophobic. You know, <laughs> we we fear we were we're 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 ruled by the seven deadly sins. You know, greed, gluttony, lust, vanity, pride, wrath, and sloth. We have that in droves, and we're easy to manipulate, and we're easy to frighten, and easy to make anger angry. And, uh, the, and, and and all of a sudden, in 1945, we discover how to use the uh, uh, to use the atom to make an atomic bomb, mm-hmm. and that is really when you started seeing things like the Foo Fighters just before that yes. starting rolling out, and you started seeing like you know, hey, these people live here. That that just the way we see it, they are cousins of us. They live here, and they have a vested interest in us not blowing up the planet we are children that are playing but are playing with tools that we should not be playing with we don't understand yes. we, we think don't... Uh, we think they they they're very very alarmed about the nuclear phenomenon they they uh they all they uh there's ufos are seen around nuclear bases all the time all the time and what we learned at that disclosure uh during the summer where it was the two pilots were saying that this is happening, this Tic Tac thing and the the, the incident, they, this is happening every single time we go out on maneuvers all over the world, every time. They're, they're watching anything to do with our nukes and keeping tabs on us. And I believe it's because they, like Stephen said, we don't think the UFOs and the people flying them are from distant star systems. We think they're much closer to home and that are their cousins to us that separated from our race 13,000 years ago. And so the when, Adunaki? Uh, no, this is the, uh, well, that's a different part. Uh, we do address some of Sitchin's work in, in our book, but this is the uh, Hiawatha asteroid impact. Uh, it was disc- the crater was finally discovered. We knew it was there because uh, there were so many indicators, uh, but the, the crater was missing. Uh, 13,000 years ago, uh, there was a mass e- extinction event on this planet. Uh, the mammoth was wiped out, the mastodon, the saber-toothed cat, the dire wolf. The Clovis people. The Clovis people of North America were wiped out. And um, it was discovered that uh, there were nano diamonds in the soil of 13,000 years ago, and nano diamonds only form in celestial impacts. When a, a meteor or asteroid comes through our atmosphere, it brings dust with it that superheats and becomes these microscopic little tiny round diamonds called di- nano diamonds. And this was found in a, a layer that is that been laid 13, down. Year 13,000 year old, old Ucello horizon. So we knew the crater was somewhere but we surmised it was under the ice sheet because it was way in north america that the concentration of nano diamonds was the highest and so recently the the climate uh, uh changed enough to cause the, the the ice sheet on greenland to melt somewhat and they were able to discover the crater underneath the hiawatha glacier in northern greenland and so this this meteor meteor or asteroid impact was so devastating it uh I believe it caused our race to separate into two and uh, one half kept its technology and the other half of us were just left on the surface of the world to, to 
uh, weather the the terrible cataclysm that was the the impact. It would have caused uh, tsunamis that we estimate between one and two thousand feet high to to have uh, gone all over the world and Good luck. scrape whatever civilization we had on the planet before that, just scrape it off and uh, drown it out. And that we actually went down to a population of only about 10,000. The genetic uh, code shows the, a bottleneck in our population at, at 13, one point. 13,000 years ago. And uh, 10,000 and 10,000 people were all that were left after the cataclysm. On the surface. On the yes. surface of the world. So anyway, we think there was um, this cataclysm put us into the Stone Age, back into the Stone Age. And modern archaeology believes that we just sat around for hundreds like a hundred thousand years homo sapien sapien that's us we've existed 120,000 years at least and suddenly they think we got smart 13,000 years ago and started having some gumption to build stuff i say that in that 107,000 years from our existence our beginning of our existence to the hiawatha asteroid impact in that time period we became a fairly advanced race with space travel. We're the ones that put the base on the moon. We're the ones that put the bases on Mars. We're the ones that built this stuff all around in our solar system. Plus, plus, plus an important point is too that in which, whichever text you read, the Bible, the Mahabharata, uh, the Ethiopian Bible, even the, uh, the Chinese texts, they talk about everybody getting a forewarning of we don't know whether it was a few years or whatnot, getting a forewarning by a disembodied voice either to build a city underground, build an ark, go to the highest Or go point, to high ground. Because yeah. there is going to be a winter like you've never seen before happening. So somebody or, or we actually knew that we had an impact that was going to be happening and we couldn't do anything about it. Or perhaps we didn't want to do anything about it. We don't know that. Well, we think that they wanted to do something about it because we believe. Did you ever see the movie Deep Impact? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, you know how um, they they decide to, in order to save part of humanity, they dig these underground arcs. Yep. And we think that that literally has happened. Well, it has. They they've, they've uh, made discoveries. They've yeah. seen like huge cities underground yeah. and like yeah. these yeah. deep <laughs> crevices yeah and exactly. they're trying to wonder like what were they hiding from and what makes sense is now comets we know <laughs> right in, Thirteen thousand years ago our, they, they book, went there to in our survive. book we also we also have a chapter just showing just how frequently these meteor impacts and these asteroid impacts happen the ones that we've discovered so far i mean they're a lot more frequent than you would think they may um, have been be bedeviling this um this advanced civilization we're discussing enough to the point where they might have uh, installed underground safety uh, caverns anyway, just for the, yeah. just to pre prevent this kind of disaster from destroying us entirely. And we, I'm can, sure, we yeah. went underground and they took the, uh, their technology with them. And that's why they seem like about a 13,000 years ahead of us in technology. I mean, we can tell they're not a million years ahead of us. They're just a little bit more ahead of us. They, they crash their ships too sometimes, right? They're not, um, they're not infallible. There's something to be said about the uh, the pyramids, like that technology, how they constructed that, but also yes. the hieroglyphics that were seen in Egypt of, and of like helicopters or UFO looking things were right. also seen halfway across the world, like in South America. Yeah, there's Bolivia, no way they were communicating they found the with each other. The Sumerian cuneiform uh, yeah. hieroglyphics to, uh, in in it. Yes, see, we think they were all over the world. We, that's why the pyramids look so much alike. The pyramids in Mexico look a lot like the pyramids in in uh, uh, Egypt. Egypt and the and the pyramids over in um, uh, what's the Asian one that looks exactly like the pyramid oh, at Chichen Itza? About, you know, Guangzhou. Yeah, there's there's. Uh, there's sites all over the world with these. They just discovered one in uh, exactly Antarctica. Par pardon, Antarctica. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, Antarctica. Yeah, and also Alaska, right? the Black Pyramid in Alaska. And Antarctica is particularly interesting. Uh, we have a, a chapter on our book about it that um, Admiral Byrd. Uh, a lot of people know about his diary. Are you familiar with his his uh, his diary? His posthumously no. discovered. Um, and he was an adventurer and a hero, American hero, and an admiral, of course, and uh, like an explorer of the time. He had this unimpeachable character and was a, a national hero. He, um, he, there is, <laughs> there's a, 
Nazi base was created under Antarctica in 1939. Oh, uh, Jesus. Hitler devoted enormous resources to the continent. In Maudland, right? And in Queen's Maudland, and uh, Queen Maudland. And he, uh, we know that the base was still there after World War II was over, and Admiral Byrd was charged with the destruction of it. And so he took a carrier group down to Antarctica in, in an operation called Operation High Jump. February of uh, 1947. Yes. And um, Bang. They, they, uh, there's a Russian documentary that goes in, in very detail about this that I had to dig up on YouTube. Uh, but it's um, apparently their carrier group, while they were there, uh, was attacked by a bunch of flying saucers that emerged from the ocean yeah. and shot like ray beams at them sank a destroyer and killed dozens of men and also uh, downed about half of their carrier based aircraft and then and then went right back down into the water and then um supposedly this operation was a six month plan but after just two months down there they turned tail and ran because of this incident they went back to buenos Aires, and they south went back america. to south america where he was he was he gave a statement to the press saying something like if we're uh, if we ever have to go to war again we're going to have an enemy that can travel from pole to pole in seconds and uh then he went and was debriefed in washington and they muzzled him uh, not another word came out about this for the rest of his life but after his death, his son was going through his effects and he found a diary in which he describes a meeting he had with the people that live under the ice. They were um, men. They uh, Nordic, had a they Nordic had a looking, Nordic looking, Germanic uh, accented men, tall, very tall and pale. And, and uh, they had a crystal city under the ice sheet there's a big gap between the ground and the ice and they've they've created a world to, to live in there there's a city there there's a um, report bird reports seeing a mammoth uh eating grass on the hills like they had salvaged a mammoth before the, uh, the hiawatha and, gra uh, and granted destroyed this guy, them. and granted this guy was made admiral before earlier than anybody else ever in united states history his he was, you know, his his character literally was un, unimpeachable. And this he, this diary is amazing if you read it. It's this it's this discussion between the two, where essentially they tell us that they're going to start the abduction program. He says, uh, "We're worried you 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 guys can't have nuclear power and nuclear weapons. You're you're just young. You're too ba you're babies. You're you're this is this power is beyond you. You shouldn't be having it." And also. Uh, you know, so we're what we're going to do is start taking remnants of your race to keep it safe and secure. And uh, so that if you do destroy yourselves, that we can uh, your race will have a future. So this is the, basically they're outlining the, the abduction program. We're going to take you and take your DNA and store your DNA just in case you blow yourselves up. So do you think we're living simultaneously with some aliens right now? For yes. Sure. We For believe sure. so. See, okay. they didn't get what they wanted. They wanted us to denuclearize and de-escalate our nukes, right? And supposedly there was a meeting between them and uh, Eisenhower. Uh, the Holland I read Hall about that. I like that Air one. State. Yeah, that was a. Uh, we actually think it did happen, and the new what their main agenda was they wanted us to give up our nukes, and they didn't get what they wanted. Uh, what we think the agreement did end up being is that okay, we'll keep your secret. If, as long as you share some of your technology with us, we won't, you know, tell the world that you exist because we, we think they discovered they, them. They keep us looking up instead of looking down. You right. Know, even the most recent stuff that some you know big name people in the UFO circle that you would you would obviously know. They keep on talking about there's one like a federation, the federation that were part of a federation since for, for the past 20 years. And two of these starships that we've been on, 
just happened to be named after two of the men that were on the uh, original Majestic 12. So some reason aliens are naming their ships after our people. So it just sounded, it just smacked of what we want to hear is on Yeah, you know? we, you know, it's like yeah we'd love Trek. there to be, we'd love there to be a federation. We'd love to be traveling yeah. the galaxy it's with cu- them, you know, yeah, nobody current, more than us would like that. You know? It's currently circulating that we've already been to 26 different solar systems yeah, but, with the tall whites and the Nordics. But and, this isn't, you know, this, it, this isn't our theory. Who's we? Uh, Which is in the no. human race? Yeah, the human right. race. Right, that yeah. we're we're part of this federation, and it's all secret, and our people are aboard these ships. And So people it, that, that are amongst us right now, that there could be a group that are still alive, we, we think have traveled with aliens to... 26 that's different what the word is, but it's not we don't we don't buy elon it. musk i think elon musk is an alien for sure <laughs> it could be, yeah. right. certainly odd. see we think in it's the certainly beginning, odd. so these people they in the beginning they're underground and they're safe and all, all of us on the surface mm-hmm. we're we're thrown back into cannibalism practically and barbarism and so we think they took pity on us and brought they came back to the surface as gods pretending to be gods and putting us back, mankind back on the right path. The whole pantheon of Greece, ancient Greece, the whole pantheon of ancient Egypt. Yeah. Uh, we think the, these were people and, you know, Veracocha in, um, South, America. in South America and Kukulkan in, uh, in the Mexico area. These are all after the flood. These flood myths talk about a god who came, showed up, taught them how to not be cannibals, taught them how to do math and grow crops and build houses again, and kind of re-educated them. And we think that they are kind of managing us for many years by playing God. And they're, it's so easy to do because they, had they hadn't they had lost all their technology. Yeah. And then the, there's all this talk about the Watchers coming to impregnate women and, 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 and marry, take wives, you know, aliens taking wives. But what if they're us? What if they're human? And of course they can, they'd be willing to take human it's, wives. It's actually <laughs> compatible for sure. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you can have children without genetic modification. There's and, a theory... And, that I kind of, I subscribe to this theory of aliens planted us here. Yes. The, the, there is that theory. Yeah. The, the whole thing, how like when we go up into space, how our bio clocks synchronize with Mars uh, yeah. almost very, very quickly. <laughs> You're talking, I think about the, um, the Anunnaki and we don't know for sure, you know, whether these are all true, but we do see evidence that the human race was uplifted at some point in uh, our existence. About 300,000 years. Ago. Yes. It looks like about 300,000 years ago, we, we had this hyper acceleration of change. We went from us, uh, Homo erectus rather Homo erectus to Homo sapien in about mm-hmm. 50,000 years. And this is like a million years of evolution. But Have you heard of the stoned quite... ape theory? Sorry? Have you heard of the stoned ape theory? Uh, I don't think I have. No. no not this it's theory ape. that uh, Homo sapien ate a mushroom that came from, <laughs> mushrooms came from a comet and Homo sapien got a hold of it because that was the only food that was available to them, ate it, expanded their mind, and that's what the the big bang in our brain was. You know, that's that's very interesting because there is a movie that came out about 40 years ago called The Bear. And I, I've heard this kind of a similar theory there that, uh, that you know, animals, especially bears that are basically loners and they're out there in the wild and they will seek out mushrooms and literally have psychedelic experiences. <laughs> just yeah, to kind of, same with jaguars. Like, yeah. Yes, yes. To, yeah. You know, so yes. There's... So the baby eating this, the baby bear eating this bright red mushroom with yellow polka dots on it. That's something just that says warning, gone. warning, warning for most of us, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Total bliss. And he had a little bear <laughs> acid trip. It's really quite hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> Rather that than cocaine. Jeez, there's a movie, Cocaine Bear. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my I, God. No, I, we haven't I seen won't, it. I won't watch that on principle. <laughs> Based on a true yeah. story. Yeah, no I know kidding. it is. Really? Yes, oh, my it is. God. <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> you know, yeah. truth is stranger than fiction, Jay. It really is. Seriously, you know? it really <laughs> is. It really is. <laughs> I wanted to bring this up with you guys as well. Like the, uh, how do you feel about light pollution nowadays? Cause you know, I feel like we're supposed to be connected with the stars and we're supposed to see the galaxy and like have an understanding. But now that there's so much light pollution, I can't even see a star right now. And it's so sad. So I'm actually I know, booking I a trip. LA, I thought there were only like 50 stars or something. As a kid. Exactly. You can only see like two. It's not two. It's supposed to light up like a Christmas tree. 
And then we moved out into the desert, and I, every yeah. time I walked outside, my mind was blown again. I, I was able to believe it all over again, you know? Yeah. But, so, yeah, I mean, light pollution essentially is destroyed the, the ground base telescope usefulness in most places, except the very, very r r most remote places. But they're really, we've, we're getting around it with our space based telescopes now that, you know, don't have. Uh, the James, a, an atmosphere to worry about. Yeah, you know, the James Webb through. that is looking into very, very deep space. James That's, Webb and yeah, the, the Hubble is the new one. Was was the last one, of course. If you think about it, like in Egypt, like the hieroglyphics, what they were seeing. I mean, there was there was minimal light, so it almost seems like the galaxy was communicating to them, and they were able to, you know, like draw the horoscopes perfectly. And you know, actually, I just, um, one of the th remember you were saying that there were some strange hieroglyphics look showing like like technology. Yeah. One of the ones is shows an enormous light bulb. Really, like a six foot long light bulb that we think they used inside their tombs to decorate the tombs because these are way underground to illuminate the tombs. Yes. Yeah, to illuminate the tombs while they decorated them. Right. See, so there's no soot on the walls, so they were not using torches. They weren't and, using mirrors either. And, and they think, well, somebody came up with a theory. Well, oh, how about uh, they just had mirrors that they could, you know, shoot the light down a, a corridor and another mirror down there would shoot it down another corridor and so on and so forth. But uh, we found this to be kind of unlikely. And uh, sure enough, there's a, a, a very detailed hieroglyph that shows an enormous uh, light bulb connected to what we now know to be a Baghdad battery. They found these battery. How old is the Baghdad battery? Like three thousand years well, old. Well, it's or more than three thousand years old. Yeah, they I were, forget. They were using a, uh, basically using a. So they had electricity a really long time ago, and we lost the technology, and then had to reinvent they were using it. Citric, they were using citric acid <laughs> with certain metals to create a uh, a current, yep. and they were hooked up yeah. with all that. Called the, the, the they were technologically or... advanced. I don't like when people just kind of mitigate that and say that they, you know, they were. They weren't. They were just a bunch of slaves and like doing this hard labor. You know, they had technology. Yeah. Yes, they did. In fact, some some of the the stones, which are uh, averaging about fifty tons and some some five tons, whatever, they have uh, machine markings on them as lathe as marks. Lathe marks. Yeah. Or like mm -hmm. they were cut. So. And, yeah, and what are you the, use a pulley? The, not using the a pulley. lining of the 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 lining of the queen's chamber, I believe, is rose quartz from about six hundred miles away down down the Nile, right? And, yep. Or up the Nile, I guess, is the right way. And uh, the the uh, people that the building of the pyramids is are attributed to were copper tool users, not even bronze. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even bronze, you could whack. You could whack that granite with a bronze tool all day, and you'll just wreck the tool. Right, it's right. It's ridiculous that these people are supposed to have built these things. It's absurd. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we certainly don't believe it. We think it was these people that went underground who kept their technology, and then when they came up as gods, they reset up some of these cities that had been destroyed from before the flood. Wouldn't they, they, you think they, that they would be able to you know, kind of cloak themselves to look like human beings if their technology was so advanced. So we could yes. almost be walking amongst them and not even sure. know it. Well, the, the Nordic aliens, there, there's a, several groups of aliens that, that people see. The mm -hmm. Nordics are human. They look in, they are indistinguishable from human beings. They're pale and tall and, and blue Check. eyed or green eyed. Check. Check. <laughs> I'm an alien. <laughs> yep. the, the, the Chinese, the, the, the Chinese have, uh, some of the ministers have come forward, at least one or two, and said, you know, hey, uh, <laughs> they, they are among us, and yeah. you'd be surprised how many there are. And I, in fact, I think I may have met one or two in my life, just uh, uh, taller, taller individuals than myself, and just didn't quite seem right like a normal human maybe, just huh? didn't quite seem right it's just like one of these intuitive feelings like no you're yeah you're not quite you're not quite human no. but we think this is the point of the breeding <laughs> program the the breeding program is to reintegrate the species i believe and also to change us from the inside out to to denuclearize their main objective is to make sure that we don't blow up the whole world and we think their alarm just the, the fact that they're so alarmed about it that they're dogging our steps every time our nukes uh, go to sea, we think that they 
uh, live here too. They're worried oh, that's about interesting. us killing them too <laughs> and blowing. That's interesting them. because if they're live if they're underground, if we poison the planet, we're poisoning their resources as well. Also, we think they need us, which is why they keep taking our genetic d- DNA. We think they need it, it, uh, it like goes, a, a farmer needs milk. You it, know, he keep taking the same person again and abducting the cow it, it, and it, taking the milk. It goes a long way to also explain the cattle mutilation, what they take from cattle, right. the skyward facing eye, the genitalia. They always exsanguinate. You know, take all the blood, and there's obviously it's not just for research and development. There's, and these are cauterized cuts. The yes. eye is cut out in a perfect circle. Yikes. That is cauterized as they cut. We can't do that now at all, but they've been doing it since the 70s. They've been doing at this least. through our cattle and all over the world, too. Australia has problems with it. South America has problems with it. We think when they went underground, they took um, a fair amount of herd animals with them. And we think that if you live underground for too long, you might start to become non viable which we believe is why they're stealing genetic material from humans and cattle. And, you know, cattle mutilations, we always hear cattle, 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 but it really is almost uh, all domestic animals, horses and sheep and goats and uh, are also yes. take, are also mm-hmm. found this way sometimes too. Damn, if you're underground that long, you should be stealing some vitamin D if you're not getting the sun. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> To me, you know, the gray aliens, they just look like human beings that have been underground for 13,000 years. No, you know, well, how would we change over 13,000 years? We'd get a little shorter. We'd get paler. Right. We'd get our mm-hmm. eyes would get bigger. Our eyes would get blacker. And, uh, you know, they move just like we do. Uh, uh, one of our witnesses uh, that we put in the book, uh, Lonnie Zamora, Sergeant we, Lonnie Zamora, yeah, he's, he's a, a cop. cop. He, um, he came upon uh, an egg-shaped alien uh, craft and with uh, four... Beings. Uh, beings around it that looked what about 50 paces he said they looked like children 10 year old children moving just like 10 year old children um i assure you that he, he didn't know but when he got closer of course he could see the bigger eyes and the slightly larger head and realized what he was seeing uh but if they are moving exactly like human children i'll tell you it means that they have the same of skeletal structure we do and the same musculature or they wouldn't move like we do that goes back to the hybrid breeding exactly correct right yeah wow you know they they may be they may be partly you know we, we don't know for a fact whether they're partly synthetic but they do definitely whatever they are they are based upon the human structure and they are certainly less emotional and and therefore much easier to control and yeah. manipulate you know you know we are like I say we are still a very violent and very fearful uh, species and that would I think that should scare anybody I think in the um, uh, in the yeah, ancient times they they controlled us by pretending to be gods but I think now they are trying to play space alien. And can wouldn't you implement yourself into artificial intelligence? <laughs> oh, pardon? Wouldn't, wouldn't you in, implement yourself into artificial intelligence somehow if you were the alien? Like that's the new big thing on the horizon right now. We're we're trying we're trying to do it right now ourselves. So and we're doing CRISPR. We're reversing diseases like sickle cell and blindness and. Uh, that's something we're, right. we're playing around with right now. And even like even people like Elon Musk are saying, maybe we should like slow down a little bit. We're like, yeah. you know, we don't want to go into 6G and 7, 7G too quick because, you know, we're looking into ro- robotic lovers and all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, we're again, we're, we're, we're children playing with very advanced toys. Yeah, there's lots of guys now that have these AI girlfriends. Oh yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a big thing too. <laughs> yeah, yeah saying leave, leave your the perfect wife, girl, you know. the perfect girl, yeah. <laughs> you know, nag or yeah, the, the, this, this is real time stuff happening, and we are just, you know, we we are we are scary. Might put it that way, we are yeah. scary. We're we're a little bit worried about AI to be sure. I mean, you know, well, yeah. we're sci-fi fans. We've seen the Terminator movies. <laughs> oh hell yeah! Well, listen, if if we're gonna be stuck on this planet with AI and aliens, I mean, we don't stand a chance. Yeah, we're we're doomed. Let's just yeah. give up now. <laughs> Yeah, we're 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 like the uh, the fifth the fifth wheel, you know. We're like the odd man. Oh, yeah, <laughs> let me off here, Jesus. <laughs> well, listen, guys, I appreciate you for being here. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. We've been talking for an hour. 
okay. Leslie and Steven. Thank you so much. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. Um, you. you guys also do a, what is this called? You're a vendor at a contact in the desert. Does that still exist? Uh, contact is a, a a yearly convention. We did it last year. Last How year. do I get um, tickets? My God. Yeah, it's in uh, it's in um, our neighborhood actually. So we'll probably do oh, it nice. again. It's, yeah, it's it's so it's just little, over the hill. So it's so it's easy a, it's to a do. Little, it's a little pricey. It's about six hundred to be a vendor. Yeah, but it's, it's you know a it, it's uh it's more expensive to travel to another city and uh, sure. <laughs> you know and uh, do that. So it's it's probably a lot cheaper. But you can awesome. find us. Um, the book is on Instagram, I mean uh, uh, Amazon rather, and also on Ingram. Um, it's under less uh, who they are and what they are up to by Leslie and Stephen Shaw. And um, the uh, we're on Instagram and Facebook at the same handle, which is Leslie.Shaw.Author, and we have a website who they are book.com with a few blogs on it and some excerpts from the book too. And, uh, that's how to, awesome. how, to how to get it. If you want it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Everyone listening, go, go ahead and check that out. I'll leave the, uh, the links in the description of the video when I post this on Monday and you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for spending time with me and talking. And you guys are like, honestly have you, you're some pretty knowledgeable folks about this. So I would love to invite you back on sometime as we, we know things are going to happen here in uh, maybe the shortcomings. You know? Yes, I, I think you're right about. I think you're right about that. Here's hoping. Yeah. Here's hoping. Thank you so yeah. much for having us, Jay. You worry me when you say that, Stephen, since I know you can see the future a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, wor I definitely worry about things sometimes a little bit too much. And to God, He can. Yeah. All right, you guys are beautiful. Yeah. Thank I you actually, very much for being here. You're welcome. Okay. Hey. All right. Bye now, everyone. Everyone at home, keep your eyes peeled. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.